Oh no! That was close! Meow. Thank you, Doctor! Oh no, little kitty! Don't thank me! Instead, thanks to my brain! Oh, hello, friends! Yes, you heard it right! The reason we can do all these awesome things in our lives is due to an essential organ in our body called the brain. So today, let us learn about this vital subject that helps us to learn about the vital subjects and explore the amazing world of the brain. Zoom in! Your brain is basically the boss of your body as it controls everything you do. Things like learning, thinking, feeling, dancing, even breathing and your heart rate. It's due to your brain you can pull pranks on your siblings and friends. And you won't believe but not even supercomputers can match its powerful ability to download, understand and react to the volume of information coming to you through your senses. So, how does the brain manage all this? Different parts of your brain control different functions. So, let us start with the largest part called the cerebrum that takes up to 85% of your brain. It's actually the thinking part of your brain and controls your muscles. It's due to the cerebrum you can walk, dance, play games and most importantly learn about various subjects on The Dr. Binox Show! Isn't it cool friends? Next comes a relatively small portion but an essential part of your brain called the cerebellum which helps you to maintain your balance and regulates motor movements. That means without the cerebellum you would be falling all over the place. Now comes a small but a mighty force to be reckoned with. The brain stem that is connected to the spinal cord. It controls those areas of your body that you don't need to work on like breathing, maintaining your heart rate, digesting food, etc. without us even knowing about it. Then comes a little almond shaped area of your brain called the amygdala. It is responsible for emotions, survival instincts and helps to store memories of events. Wow! A small part with big responsibilities. Trivia time! Did you know that your brain generates about 12 to 25 watts of electricity? That is enough to power a low voltage LED light. Also, scientists have recently discovered that for a period of time after you have exercised, your body produces a chemical that makes your brain more willing to learn. So if you are stuck on some difficult homework, go out and run, play or exercise around for a while. Then tackle the problem again. You might discover that you are much more able to solve it. Until next time, it's me Dr. Binox zooming out. Oh little kitty, please stop playing the drum. It's hurting my ears. Thanks for stopping kitty. The sound was giving me a headache. But is it due to the noise coming out of the drum or is there any other factor behind it? In fact, the most important question is what causes headaches in the first place? Hey friends, in today's episode, let us explore this painful topic and answer the aching question that we all should know about. That is, what causes headaches? Zoom in! So friends, I'm sure most of us suffer from headaches now and then. It is a kind of pain we feel in our head and upper neck. 
Although it may feel as if your brain is hurting a lot, but despite the widespread belief, headaches aren't the pain in your brain as it does not have the receptors to feel the pain. Yes, headaches are actually a way through which our brain tells us when other parts of our body hurt. So, what causes this pain? Well, this type of pain generally arises in the nerves, blood vessels and muscles around your head and neck. And sometimes, these muscles or blood vessels swell or tighten, putting pressure on the nerves that send a rush of pain messages to the brain, resulting in a headache. There are two common types of headaches people generally suffer from, namely tension headaches and migraines. Tension headache feels like a tight band tied around the forehead and is caused due to contraction of the muscle in the head and neck region and intensity of pain is dull whereas migraines are an extremely painful headache that is accompanied by nausea or vomiting and sensitivity to lights and sounds. And if you think your headache may be migraines, do visit your doctor if needed to treat your pain who can prescribe medicine to help control the headaches. But sometimes all you need is relaxation exercises or changes in your diet or better sleeping habits to prevent tension and migraine headaches in the first place. Trivia time! Did you know many foods contain chemicals that can trigger migraines and possibly other types of headaches? Yes, Chinese food which may contain monosodium glutamate aka MSG and sugar-free foods sweetened with aspartame or sucralose could be the reason behind those headaches in some people. So, it's essential to track what you eat in a journal to sort it out. Also, ice cream headaches are no myth. You really can get them from eating this frozen dessert. This is caused by blood vessel spasms which are caused by the intense cold from the ice cream. The spasms interrupt the blood flow and cause the vessels to swell. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. Until next time, it's me Dr. Binox zooming out. Oh, never mind. <laughs>「little kitty, eating ice cream so fast could lead to brain freeze.」Hey friends, have you ever wondered why you get a brain cramp every time you gulp down those tasty icy cold drinks and ice creams? Well, in today's episode, let us explore the shocking answer behind this painful sensation and find the answer to a chilly question. Why do we get a brain freeze? Zoom in! Hey friends, I'm sure we all must have experienced brain freeze at some point of time in life. It is also known as ice cream headache or sphenophthalatine ganglion neuralgia which means pain in the nerves in your face, the roof of your mouth and around your sinuses. Gosh, don't know about the brain freeze but that name will surely give a headache to many. <laughs> so, coming back to the most important question, why do we get it? Does our brain hate to eat ice cream or other cold stuff? Well, I'm sure it does not because there is a neurological reason behind this shocking phenomenon. So, let us see what that is. Well, imagine you open the refrigerator and you see a divine scoop of ice cream right in front of you waiting to be eaten by you and only you. But suddenly, you hear your sibling marching down the staircase and you yank the ice cream and quickly eat a spoonful of it faster than the speed of light. When suddenly, everything around your face and head 
starts to feel squeezed as your brain gets frozen for a moment and you get a brain freeze. But why is that? That's because when you sip an icy drink or consume ice cream super fast, the temperature in the back of your throat drops rapidly that has two essential nerves behind it. The first is the internal carotid artery which feeds blood to the brain and the other is the anterior cerebral artery which is where the brain tissue starts. And one thing your brain doesn't appreciate much is a sudden change in the temperature. And when the cold hits, it causes expansion and contraction of these arteries causing a sudden change in the blood flow. And that's the sensation that the brain interprets as a type of pain we call brain freeze. So, now you know the reason behind that headache that comes and goes. That comes and goes. <laughs> Oops, sorry. But the question remains, how do we avoid getting these headaches and what we should do when it occurs? Well, there are two ways to deal with it. First is the easy way and the other is the most difficult thing to apply. The easier method is you can push your tongue up to the roof of your mouth because it can help to normalize the temperature in your mouth. And the difficult thing is to stop eating ice cream and other cold stuff at all. Which I think isn't really necessary because brain freeze isn't deadly and it goes away as quickly as it comes. So, go ahead and enjoy that ice cream. Trivia time! Did you know brain freeze is one of the most common types of headaches experienced? Yes, it affects between 5.9% and 74% of adults and around 79% of children. Also, some research shows that people who experience brain freeze also tend to experience migraines. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. Until next time, it's me, Dr. Binox, zooming out. Oh, never mind. Oh, what happened? Oh, you meant you passed the test. Congratulations on it. But for a moment, I felt like someone screamed that you passed out or fainted. Fainted? Yes, little kitty. Fainting is pretty common amongst humans. Hey friends, so in today's episode, let me explain this biological phenomenon by answering a head-turning question. Why do we faint? Zoom in! I'm sure most of us must have seen scenes from movies where people faint after hearing some bad news or smelling dirty socks. Even in day-to-day -day life, we often find people passing out due to lack of food or poor health. But what exactly is happening to their bodies during such a moment? Well, to know that, first we need to understand what exactly is fainting. Fainting, medically known as syncope, is a temporary loss of consciousness. It happens because our brain stops receiving enough oxygen-rich blood to continue its daily activities and loses the normal state of being awake and understanding what is happening around us. Now, there are multiple factors behind this loss of consciousness, but the most common reason is a drop in blood pressure due to a strong vasovagal response often triggered by a reaction to something that shocks us. This reflex is named after the vagus nerve which runs from your brain to your heart, lungs and digestive tract. 
The job of the vagus nerve is to stabilize the blood pressure when we are shocked or frightened, which leads to an increase in heart rate, shooting up the blood pressure. But sometimes these nerves malfunction and reduce the blood pressure more than normal, leading to a lack of blood supply to our brain, resulting in a brief loss of consciousness or fainting. Besides reacting to the sight of something that scares you or having an intense emotional reaction, some other triggers can also cause a vasovagal syncope, which includes getting overheated, standing for a long time, intense physical activity, etc. So, it's vital to know the early signs of fainting to avoid making things worse. And what are these signs? Well, if someone is about to faint, they will show symptoms such as dizziness, lightheadedness, paleness, vision changes, fast or irregular heartbeat, sweating and vomiting. And when that happens, immediately stop doing whatever you are involved in and if possible, lie down on the floor. This can help prevent a fainting attack, letting blood get to the brain. And once you feel better, please stand up slowly. But to prevent fainting in the first place, make sure to keep yourself hydrated by drinking plenty of water throughout the day. Also, it's vital to keep your blood circulating by moving around whenever possible playing outside, doing regular exercise and avoiding sitting in one place for a longer period. And whenever you feel anxious, slowly breathe into a paper bag to stabilize the emotions and blood pressure. Remember my friends, if you've only fainted once, it was brief and the reasons are obvious, then there's usually no need to worry about it. But if it happens regularly, then it's crucial to make an appointment with your doctor. Trivia time! Did you know, compared to younger adults, syncope occurs up to twice as often in adults older than 70 and up to four times as often in adults over the age of 80. Also, syncope accounts for 2 to 6% of emergency room visits and 4% of hospital admissions every year. Hope you learned something new today. Until next time, it's me, Dr. Binox, zooming out. Oh, never mind. Oh, are you okay, little kitty? Yes. Oh no, I think the injury on your head is causing you to stutter. Stutter? Yes, kitty. Stuttering or stammering is an interruption in the flow of speech that many kids go through while growing up. Hey friends, I'm sure a lot of us must have faced this speech disorder. So, in today's episode, let us look at the science behind it and answer a crucial question. What causes stuttering? Zoom in! So, what is stuttering? It is a type of disfluency in the flow of speech that can make the person repeat certain syllables, words, phrases, or even drag out part of a word. Children and even adults who stammer know what they have to say, but the words just don't come out easily. But the vital question is, what causes this stuttering amongst us? Well, so far, researchers aren't entirely sure why some people stutter. But most believe 
that certain factors contribute to it, such as a problem with the way the brain's message interacts with the muscles and body parts needed for speaking. You see, humans have a remarkable ability to share their thoughts through speech and language. And to make this talking process smooth, two parts of the brain called Wernicke's area and Broca's area play a crucial role in it. Yes, the Wernicke's area is said to be located in the temporal lobe on the left side of the brain region. Although the exact location of this region is still debatable. But what we surely know is that this area is essential for language development and helps us choose the right words while expressing our views. And once thought is coded into language, the Broca's area in the frontal lobe of the dominant hemisphere of the brain gets activated. This region then sends the message to the muscles that control speech, telling them to move and make the right sounds come out. Then the mouth, face, neck, tongue and throat muscles move to form words and that's how we can smoothly communicate. But in some cases, this process doesn't work perfectly. If a brain stroke or injury either damages the Broca's area or reduces the blood flow in this part of the brain, due to this, the brain finds it hard to send a signal to the speech muscles, which causes a person to stammer while speaking. The first signs of stuttering tend to appear when a child is about 18 to 24 months old as the brain is still developing and in many cases it goes away on its own by the age of 5. But if someone continues to stutter after the age of 5, it is recommended to talk to your doctor or a speech language therapist. Also, remember my friends, if someone you know stutters, it does not mean that they are less bright by any means. In fact, they are intelligent as anyone who speaks fluently. And you won't believe many individuals who have the speech disorder went on to achieve great heights in life. Some of them are the legendary singer Elvis Presley, legendary actor Rowan Atkinson, and the legendary naturalist who gave us the theory of evolution, none other than Charles Darwin. Trivia time! Did you know stuttering is more common in boys than girls? Singing is an effective method to generating more fluent speech in individuals who stutter. Hope you learned something new in today's episode. Until next time, it's me, Dr. Binox, zooming out. Ow! Never mind. Hey, friends. Let me ask you a very interesting question today. What do Albert Einstein, Walt Disney, Steven Spielberg, Kira Knightley have in common? Think. Not sure? Well, the answer is that they are very famous, successful and dyslexic. And what is that? In today's episode, let us learn about this neurological condition called dyslexia and spread awareness about it amongst our friends and family. Zoom in! We live in a world full of unique and different people. People with different eyes, hair, skin, 
that gives us distinctive personalities and functionalities. But there is one element that we all possess that looks the same but functions differently. And that is our brain that can see and understand the world differently for different people. One of those ways is through the perspective of dyslexia that affects our ability to read, spell, write and speak clearly. Unfortunately, people with dyslexia are often misunderstood as not so intelligent. But remember my friends, that is not the case at all as it has nothing to do with intelligence. And it's just their brains finding it challenging to process specific tasks at a reasonable speed. Yes, my friends, despite having normal and even high intelligence, a dyslexic person may show certain symptoms such as difficulty in remembering the right names for things, problems with directions like telling right from left or up from down. They may need more thinking time to remember the right word and for some, it could be challenging to hold a pen or write by hand and much more. But the main problem in dyslexia is trouble recognizing phonemes. For example, the basic sounds of speech like B in bat and P in pad are often mixed with one another. But the most crucial question is, what makes a dyslexic person so unique? Well, to know that, we need to enter their brain to analyze the whole situation. As we know, the brain is divided into two parts. The left hemisphere takes care of processing the language and is the more academic and logical side of the brain. And the right hemisphere is the more artistic and creative side of the brain. Scientists have studied that brains of those with dyslexia rely more on the right side of the brain and frontal lobe as compared to the brains of non-dyslexic people. This means when they read a word, it takes a longer route through their brain and can get delayed on the frontal lobe. And because of this neurological condition, they find it challenging to undertake tasks depending on the left hemisphere of the brain, such as reading, writing, solving math problems, etc. But here is the good news. A person with dyslexia may see things differently, but it could really work in their favor as well. Yes, even though they struggle with reading, they can be very good with painting, inventing things, singing, telling stories and making people laugh. And eventually, just like many other successful and revolutionary dyslexics, they have the ability to see the bigger picture. Trivia time! Did you know the word dyslexia? comes from two Greek words, this which means difficulty and lexis which refers to language or words. Also, the dyslexic brain is actually larger and typically much more creative than the average brain. Remember my friends, next time if you see your friends or family members struggling with reading or writing, Make sure to understand their situation and help them to realize that it's absolutely okay to be that way. Don't tease them or bully them because you never know you might be looking at tomorrow's Einstein or Da Vinci or Whoopi Goldberg or even better 
their unique self that has the power to change the world. Think about it. Until next time, it's me, Dr. Binox, zooming out. Hmm, where is it? Where did I keep it? Well, do you remember where I kept my specs? No idea. Hmm, I keep forgetting a lot lately. I think I should get myself tested for Alzheimer's. Hmm, what's that? Well, that information I do thoroughly remember. So, in today's episode, let us try to understand this forgetful question. What is Alzheimer's disease? Zoom in! Forgetting is a part of everyone's life, and it gets more common as we grow old. But on some rare occasions, after the age of 60, this forgetfulness turns into a severe disorder called Alzheimer's a condition that permanently affects the brain. Yes, in this state, the affected person starts to lose memory and can even forget the names and faces of close ones. They also lose their thinking skills and the capacity to carry out easy tasks like how to tie a shoelace. They even see or hear things that are not there, lose their way, have trouble sleeping, or say the same things over and over. Overall, this is a very unfortunate state to be in and can cause them to become frustrated and angry with you for no reason. However, it is very important to know that they do not mean to treat you badly. It's just that Alzheimer's disease makes the person act in this unfortunate way. But the vital question is, what causes this disease in the first place? Around 1901, Dr. Alois Alzheimer, a German psychiatrist, had a female patient with an unusual mental illness. After she passed away, he decided to examine her brain and saw many misfolded proteins called plagues and bundles of fibers called neurofibrillary tangles. These misfolded proteins are responsible for breaking down the brain structure by blocking signals and communications between cells. They also begin an immune reaction that causes the collapse of disabled nerve cells, because of which the brain can't process or store the information properly. Another major reason behind Alzheimer's disease is a component of neurofibrillary tangles called TOR. Its job is to hold together the microtubes that pass the food molecules to other parts of the brain. But in Alzheimer's, Tor gets unstuck from the tube which leads to its disintegration, stopping food nutrients from reaching the brain cells, which ultimately destroys them. But there is still a lot we don't know about this condition, because of which we are yet to find a cure for this unfortunate mental illness, and all we can do is help slow it down. On the good side, scientists believe that exercising, eating healthy, meditation, and keeping your mind active by playing puzzles may help delay the start of Alzheimer's disease. And here is the most important part, my friends. If anyone you know is suffering from this condition, they might act strange at times. But remember, that it is not anyone's fault there. So please be kind to them, try to be patient, and show more love. Trivia time! 
Did you know that more than 6 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's? Yes, and by 2050, this number is projected to rise to nearly 13 million. Hope you learned something new today. Until next time, it's me, Dr. Pinox, zooming out. Where are my specs? Hmm, never mind. Oh no, you sound slurred. Let me take you to the hospital. Phew, I hope everything is okay with Kitty. As difficulty in speech can signify a brain stroke. So by the time the vet checks her, let me explain the reasons behind it by answering a life-saving question. What causes a brain stroke? Zoom in! So what is a stroke? A stroke also known as a brain attack happens when the blood flow to the brain stops even if it's for a second. It is one of the most common causes of natural fatality and the leading cause of preventable disability. But the critical question is, what causes stroke in the first place? Well, for that, first it's essential to know a little something about our brain. You see, our brain makes up just 2% of our body's mass. But as it runs your nervous system, it consumes around 20% or about a fifth of the total oxygen in your blood. But this oxygen is sent to the brain through a system of arteries. Cartoid arteries supply oxygen to the front side of the brain, while vertebral arteries supply the oxygen to the back. But it's essential to know that this oxygen is carried to the brain by our blood vessels. So in case the blood flow stops, the brain cells begin to die, leading to brain stroke, which can happen in two ways, namely the hemorrhagic stroke and the ischemia stroke. In hemorrhagic stroke, a blood vessel breaks, flooding the brain with blood and damaging brain cells. Whereas in ischemia, a clot in the arteries blocks the blood supply from reaching the brain. But the vital question is, where do these clots come from? Well, in some cases, a sudden change in heartbeats prevents the upper chamber of the heart from contracting normally. This change in rhythm slows down the blood pressure, which allows things like fibrin, platelets and clotting factors to stick together and become a lump. This lump can get into the arteries, supplying blood and oxygen to the brain. And if the clot is big enough, it can get stuck on the way cutting the blood supply. And no blood supply means no oxygen can reach the brain. And as the brain does not have pain receptors, the person does not feel the blockage. But this lack of oxygen begins to affect brain functions. And depending on the area of stroke, the person will show certain symptoms like slurred speech, blurred vision, and sudden weakness, often in just one side of the body. And if no help arrives on time, the brain cells will start to die, leading to brain damage that may be severe or permanent. That's why if you see anyone with said symptoms, consider it as a medical emergency and take them to the hospital ASAP. Over there, the doctor will give them a medication called Tissue Plasminogen Activator that can break apart the blood clot and allow blood supply like before. If given on time, this medication can decrease the chances of getting a stroke. And if for some reason 
the patient can't be given the drug, then the doctor can perform surgery to remove the clot from the affected artery. Remember my friends, stroke can happen to anyone. So it's essential to stay healthy by eating well, exercising regularly and meditating to reduce stress. Trivia time! Did you know someone in the world has a stroke every two seconds? And about 87% of all strokes are ischemic strokes. Hope you learned something critical today. Until next time, it's me Dr. Binox zooming out. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs>